started. The purpose of the session today is to demonstrate how having an inspiring life vision will make you more happy and successful now. I'm not about having a vision in the future and sacrificing the now. No, we will use the tool of vision to improve our here and now, to improve our present. And the second purpose of today is to share some principles that will make it easier and simpler for you to design an inspiring life vision. So this session is for you. If you already have a life vision and you just want to make it sharper. And also this session is for you if you don't have a life vision and you want to build one from scratch. And I'd love to get a feeling from the people we have live today. Which one of the two are you? Uh, if, how clear is your life vision from one to ten? One is you have no idea where you want to be in three years. And ten you're really clear. You have a holistic vision about career, life. It's really cl clear where you're going. Let me see. Can we do a self-assessment? And you can have, do it privately or you can share it in the group. I'm happy. I, I know this is a personal question too, but if you're happy to share, I'd love to, to see uh, where the group is. Okay. In the middle, we have um, here. Okay. Two. That means a little bit unclear the vision. Five, seven, six, six, fantastic. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some inspiration to, from this session to clarify our vision even more. Four, life is like a box of chocolate made mode. I love this, Leo. Uh, five, five, okay. It's a big question. It's one of the biggest questions in our life. What do we want? What do we want to create for ourselves, our loved ones? Where are we going? Uh, so I, I haven't met anyone, including myself, that we are at 10. Like I really, it, it's, it's an ever evolving. Our vision is ever evolving, but it's a, a, what, one question that is worth pondering upon and thinking and doing the work because it, it is our life. It's, we're, we're for a limited time here on earth. So being intentional, what do we want to create? How do we want this life to look uh, is important versus just following opportunities and ending up somewhere that is not what we wanted. Here's what I'll share. The number one secret to realizing your vision faster than you expected. The two biggest mistakes people make when designing their vision and the number one obstacle you will need to overcome to get clarity around your desired future. These are the three pieces of the masterclass. And in the end, for those of you who are interested, I will also share some information about my group coaching program, The Vision Path. Let's start with the secret to realizing your vision faster than you ever imagined. And I, by start, I mean, I'll start in the beginning. How did I become interested in, in life vision. And it all started in 2009. You can see me in the photo there. I had just uh, graduated from my INSEAD MBA in France and I was jobless. I went into the MBA hoping it will be a phenomenal. I will have a lot of job offers. And then Lehman Brothers happened and the recession happened and I graduated jobless. I went back to Greece uh, while I had already an international career before the MBA I was in Spain. And I didn't even have a room. I, I'm, I'm sitting in that sofa and I'm sleeping in that sofa. It's in a hallway in my mother's apartment and I'm applying to jobs. I wanted to move to the UK and I don't have any success. I, I don't even get an interview. I don't even hear back. And I'm applying like full-time job and nothing's happening. And I started getting more and more depressed. And uh, I, I'm obviously broke and I had given all my money and even borrowed money to do this MBA. And my mom saw, saw me like this and she said, come for a weekend to a beach house of a friend uh, to get your mind off things. And I went for the, that weekend away and that friend of my mom gave me a book and the book was called The Secret. And I know it is a controversial book and there are things that we can agree with the book and things we don't agree. I, I know you've, most of you have heard of the book, but for me at that time, this book helped me 
have two breakthroughs. The first breakthrough was that you need to be clear on what you want if you ever are to achieve it. So the first breakthrough was making your vision tangible. And I had this notion I wanted to move to the UK, work in media in the UK. And I followed the book. I was inspired by the book. And I said, okay, I need to be more clear. What is it that I want? And I asked myself, what would be the dream job? And what came when I asked this question, the, the secret desire was I would love to work for Google. And you need to, to imagine back then, 2009, Google is the number one employer in the world. They receive 2 million CVs a year. I, on the other hand, my CV, apart from the fancy MBA, is not very impressive. My previous experience was in a company that was called Circus Marketing Communications. Nonetheless, this is what I wanted. And I'm going to YouTube and I found, found a video of the offices in the UK. The video doesn't exist anymore because the offices changed, but I found a photo of how the offices looked back like then. And I started visualizing myself in those offices, working in those offices. And a couple of days later, after I had watched that YouTube video, I received a phone call freakishly and it was Google. And it was a Google recruiter. And he said, hello, you remember you applied to one job a few weeks back and we rejected you? I was like, yes, I remember that. Um, yeah, we have a new job in that department, which we think will be a better fit. Would you like to apply? And I'm like, yes, of course. And I did two things that I wouldn't have done before this initiation I had in visualization. First one was that I stopped applying to anything else. And the reason was because I believe strongly I will get that job. And also I wanted to, because I knew what I wanted and this is what I wanted, I, I wanted to maximize my probabilities of getting it. And that meant I couldn't be distracted or spread too thin applying to different things that I didn't want as much. I knew, now that I knew what I wanted, I wanted all my efforts to be focused, stopped applying to everything, to anything else, focused on preparing for the Google job. And the second thing I did was tell everybody which again, this is not what we do. We don't share with people something before it's a done deal. I told everybody, my classmates, my friends, I'm applying for Google. And for me, that was raising the stakes and also making it so strong, my belief that I'm going to get this job so I can let people know from now. And I moved to the UK. The second breakthrough I had through this book, first was make your vision tangible. The second was embody the vision. So what happened is I started feeling happy and excited like I had the job in my pocket. I moved to the UK and the reality was grim, right? I'm, I'm broke. I didn't even have a house in the UK. I'm living in a friend's sofa again, but I'm happy because I'm getting this job. And this was the building and I went into the day of the interviews. I went earlier and I had a coffee opposite and I was looking in those glasses and I was seeing the fancy Google stuff. They had some bean bags and some Pilates ball, balls. And I, I started getting excited that this is where I'm going to work. And I'm not going into interview, I'm going in to meet my new colleagues and look, meet my new offices. And I went in and I remember the director that the last interview, he was a scary dude. He, um, and he told me, everybody looks at me like I'm a bear, but you don't. You, you, you look so confident and relaxed. And that's what got me the job. So that was my experience. And that was the email I received back then with the Google offer. And I stayed at Google for eight years. And, and then I got curious. This happened to me. It looked like kind of magical, but also really right. Did this happen to other people? And the more I researched, the more I saw more successful people saying, attributing their success to having a clear vision. Arnold Schwarzenegger, he would envision since very young him winning Mr. Universe. And he would appear to the Mr. Universe um, competition like he owned the place before he won it. And he did the same when he moved to the movies. Oprah, he, she will say, create the highest, grandest vision of your life because you become what you believe. Will Smith is a big believer of this. He says in his mind, he was always an A-lister Hollywood star. And the list goes on and on. Muhammad Ali, 
he's one of the most famous with his mantra, I'm the greatest. And he says, if I be, my mind can believe it and my heart can believe it, I can achieve it. The same Idris Elba. He said he would visualize himself getting awards even before he became famous. And finally, Michael Jordan, he, he said every time he felt discouraged from the training, every time he felt tired, he would close his eyes and envision his name on that list. And that will give him the energy to go back and play. And okay, I found um, what the famous people had said and the successful people had said. I wanted to, I'm, I'm a logical person. I wanted to see what the scientists said. So I, I, I went and reviewed the research and let me make this a little bit bigger for you. And feel free to post questions, by the way, in the comments. I'm happy to take questions as I'm going with this. Um, and what does the research say? That the thalamus in our brain makes no distinction between inner and outer realities. So any idea, if we contemplate it long enough, our brain starts believing it's true. And we, we know that, right? You even watch a movie and you cry and you laugh. Your brain doesn't know it's not a reality. And even if you don't have the, the, an image, even an inner image, a mental imagery, your brain will start believing this is true and new neural pathways are created. And what happens to your self-esteem goes up. What happens to your confidence and goes up. What happens to your happiness, it goes up. And we know those things are important in us achieving our visions, achieving the abundance, the relationships. This is proven. And this was what happened with me with the Google job. It was the confidence in the, that got me the job. And the confidence came of me believing that this vision is happening. And one even more interesting experiment is the second one from the paper, Neuroscience Behind Visualization. They, the, the scientists took two groups. And the first group, they told them, exercise your muscles, exercise your hands. And the second group, they told them, visualizing your exercise in your hands. And what they found was that the group that was visualizing exercising their hands, they improved their muscle strength 35%, very little less than the actual people that were physically exercising their hands. Isn't this unbelievable? You can sit there visualizing your exercising and your muscle improves by 35%. I believe that the power of our mind, the power of visualization is so underestimated. And I have a third study there about how people that had used mental imagery, imagery were achieving their SMART goals uh, more and more successfully. So what is the secret to achieving your vision faster than you were ex ever expected? This is it. A successful vision is a place you come from, not a place you're going. Let me say this again. A successful vision is a place you come from, not a place you're going. What does this mean? That means you, it's not around feeling awful in the now and working hard towards the future. That's not it. It's around having the vision and behaving and feeling and embodying it, the vision now. And that's how your neural chemistry changes. That's how you change. And that your happiness, your confidence will make the reality around you rearrange itself and change to accommodate the new you. And this is not a new advice. I've been hearing this advice, the fake it till you make it or um, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. And it's not around faking it, really. It's around remembering that a vision is a place you come from and feeling and behaving and embodying and being aligned with what that vision you want that identity you want be that person and that's when you will attract the right opportunities and the right people any questions on that that's the first the secret please type in the comments if you have any questions and throughout and I'll wait for a minute for the comments. And let me keep on going then. What's the number one mistake people make 
when designing their vision. And I learned this when I was in Halt uh, Business School, Halt Ashridge Business School. And this is the building you see in that slide. It's a castle. And it was 2014. I'm in uh, maternity leave. And I've already been at Google for five years. And I want to go and do a course there. And that's where I did my master's in executive coaching in Halt Ashridge Business School. And it was a whole affair because I had a newborn. I'm flying my in-laws from Greece. We're renting a place there in the castle. I have to tend to the newborn while I'm not in class, but I'm there. And my identity up until that point was that I'm, I was a problem solver. And I know many of you um, in this event, you have a similar identity. You're good. You're, you're good at solving problems. So there was a class and I joined that was called Solution Focused Coaching. And I'm excited about this class. I'm like, yes, this is it. This is what I love doing. And I go into this class and they tell us, if a client comes with a problem, a coaching client, you shouldn't talk about the problem. And I'm kind of shocked. I'm like, what? what? I shouldn't talk about the problem. How am I going to, to help them with a the problem? No, no, no. They say, you talk about what works. You talk about the solution. And it was so eye-opening to me. And I want to give you an example. If a client before I did this training came and said, oh, I have a problem. I'm nervous about a meeting I have tomorrow. I will start analyzing the problem. I will say, okay, you're nervous. What are your thoughts? What are you afraid of? Where does it maybe potentially, where does this fear come from? Trying to analyze what's going on in order to find a solution. But that's not solution-focused coaching. Now, if a client comes, especially if they have a meeting tomorrow, like we can analyze if there's not an urgency, but if I really want to help them for the meeting tomorrow, I'm not going to analyze that problem. I'm going to say, okay, tell me about a meeting you did and went well. And they're going to say, oh, yes, so three weeks ago, I had a meeting and I got good feedback. Okay, tell me about another meeting that went well. Yeah, a year ago, I went for this interview and I got the job. So I guess that was a meeting that went well. And we may find all this red, uh, pink bubbles or these exceptions to the problem. And then we analyze those. We analyze the solution. Okay, what did you do in those meetings? Maybe you exercised before, or maybe you felt comfortable in what you were wearing, or maybe you, you knew the people before, so you had reached out before the big meeting. We try to find what works, and this is how you can effectively help people. So how does this re relate to defining your life vision? The number one mistake people make is focus on what they don't want instead of what they want. And they will say, for example, I want to stop working uh, when I'm 55. I want to be free of debt. I want to lose weight. I want not to have this awful boss I have. All of this have in common that is are the things you don't want. And this is where your focus goes. And this is not effective. What you want is the mental imagery in order for you to create the future, in order for you to, be, to create the reality, you need to create a vivid reality of what you want, not what you don't want, not, not working or not having a bad boss, not having the weight, not having what, whatever it is, the debt, whatever it is that you want to avoid having. What, what do you want to have? Create that mental imagery and that will help you. Uh, have a, a more successful vision. Any questions on that? All right, let's move to the second mistake that people make when they design their vision. And I have a story about this one. This is a date I was uh, with my husband. This is a recent date, but I, ha I I didn't have a photo of that day that happened. It happened, I think, in 2016, 15. I, I don't even, I'm not even sure about the year. And we're on a date and we have this question that we ponder, what would we do if we won the lottery? And we started discussing and exploring this question and what came and we agreed for both of us was that I would love we would love to spend months in a tropical island 
and we started having this fun exercise. We will be in a tropical island. We will be by the beach. We won't be working. We'll be doing yoga and built that dream as well. And another tip I wanted to give you that helped me tap into that desire was noticing when I felt envy. And this is a great tip I give to all my clients. Notice when you feel a little bit jealous, because for me at the time, I was feeling a little bit jealous when I would read about someone doing backpacking in Southeast Asia, about the digital nomads, about the people taking sabbaticals and all, all those things. That was when I felt a pinch of jealousy. And that's a great sign to tapping into your desire, into what you want. And when we did that exercise, this lo looked like an impossible dream. I was an, a Google employee. We had a, a child. Um, my, my husband had a, an, an also a job in London, a senior role. It looked impossible. It looked something in the future. But then what happened is I became pregnant for my with my second child and I was sick with both pregnancies with hyperemesis and I'm in bed. And at the time I feel blackness, right? Uh, because I'm not working because I cannot work because of the hyperemesis and I'm not parenting my child. I'm in bed. I, I feel all my identity as a Google employee, as a parent was stripping away. And thankfully I found a, a TED talk about sabbaticals. And the idea was in the TED talk, it was a designer and I, I need to find it, might probably link it in the comments for you that are interested in that TED talk. It was around taking years out of your retirement and bringing them earlier, every seven years go taking a sabbatical. That means you'll retire later, but that also means you will enjoy many retirements along your productive years. And I love this idea. And that's what happens, right? When you are clear on what you want, new ideas will come to you, new opportunities will come to you that will start making what seemed like impossible, what's more possible. And I, I, I saw that idea and then I realized it was a perfect timing because I was pregnant at the time and soon I would have a, I could get a one year maternity leave from Google. And then I discussed it with my husband, whether he, how will you feel to quit his job and move to a tropical island with me during the maternity leave. And he said, okay, like it was a good timing for him too. He felt complete with that role. He felt okay leaving that job and taking that risk. And, and that's what we did. We took a one year sabbatical. We spent a few months in Greece in our home country. And six of these months we were in Koh Samui, Thailand. This is the family. And it was everything. I imagine it would be. It's too, It's so many years later now and still this six months filled me with so much happiness and I'm so happy we did that. And we did, yeah, we took a risk. My husband quit his job, uh, but he found a job coming back. And we will always have the memories of having this young family and spending six months in a tropical island, which was a dream um, that came true. Why am I sharing this with you? Because... The second mistake people make when they define their vision, they focus on what you think is possible instead of what brings you joy. And the reason I have the bumblebee here, it is because in NASA, they have a poster of a bumblebee and they say, the body of the bumblebee is not supposed to fly. Thankfully, the bumblebee doesn't know that. And that's because the bumblebee aerodynamically, if it was a plane, it wouldn't be able to fly because it's very heavy and small, short wings. But the bumblebee doesn't know the laws of aerodynamic and physics and it just flies. And that's an inspirational poster in NASA. And I think it's a great illustration about this point. Um, recently, a few months back, I was coaching an executive and he... Um, I, I got, sorry, I got a comment from someone that lost connection. Unfortunately, we'll keep trying to join again. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. Um, I was coaching an executive a few months back and he had been out of a job for three years. And when he came to work with me and in the second session, he felt the need to, to talk to me about all the applications he had done. And he would reach the final stage when it was between him and someone else. 
and he would always lose the job. And he started saying one, two, 30 jobs. And they were all in tech because he was an executive in tech. And I asked him, I said, okay, out of this 30 jobs, how many of those did you really want to do? And he said, none of them. He didn't want to be in tech anymore. He was applying to tech jobs because that's what makes sense. That's what's, what seemed to be the more possible, the more easy job to get, but he wasn't getting it. And our hypothesis was that at the C-level, he was a previous CEO at this level, it's not about the CV, it's around the energy you have. And in that final stage, there was something that wasn't feeling aligned because you didn't really want to be in tech anymore. And that's why he, he was in, in that situation. And I see this all again and again. I, I got another client recently. He said, I designed a mind map with all the options of jobs I could realistically get. And I'm like, no, 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 this is not around. We don't start with what you can realistically get. We don't know. You start with the vision of what brings me joy, what will make me come alive. And, that, and, and then after you're clear with the desire, then we can make experiments, then we can look at strategies, then we can tone it down, but you don't start with what you can realistically get. I do have a question. Let me let me see this. Let me bring it actually. Uh, how specific should this vision be? Yours working for Google is very clear, specific versus I want to work in tech. Is there a value in having a precise vision? And would you recommend revisiting visioning on a regular basis? As I imagine one once, evol once evolve over time. So I would say there's not a hard rule on how specific you want it to be, as long as it's honest and makes you come excited, like for and being inspirational. So if working in tech, I would say you, you want to be more specific on that. I would have um, at least three then dream, dream jobs, dream companies there to, to give you some inspiration of this is what I would, or, or if you're not really into big companies and you want a startup, so it's hard for you to know how to have the brand because you don't know, then make it a little bit more specific. Um, when I work on career coaching, we actually clarify the options. We go start with the location because I'm always starting as I posted when I rescheduled this session. I am starting with personal life first, relationships first, health first. So I start, where do you want to work? Location first. And this is very hard because I, I coach a lot of executives, MBAs that they want anywhere in the world where I can find a cool job. No, no, no. If you had a magic wand, where in the world you want to work on? And then we make it more specific. Yes, industry, tech, function, if possible, we'll specify that. Size of business, we'll specify that. And, and if, even if you're not sure, we will create two or three options and then we'll experiment which ones um, you like. Right? By experiments, we'll may, may, maybe meet the people that work there, do a volunteering project. Um, is there value in having a precise vision? Yes because you, we know what we want. It's just more, when we have a generic vision, it's more out of fear that let me have a more generic vision and that will make it more possible. But the more, if you're clear on what you want, you're more likely to get it. Would you recommend revisiting visioning on a regular basis? Yes. I, the, the big themes might not change. I would say some big themes might not change even for three years. Uh, but I would say at least on a yearly basis or even more often, like, for, and especially when big life events happen, uh, for me, even for me, I told you I was, um, my, my family got sick uh, the last week, so I was sick and it happens when I'm sick and, and I cannot work and I cannot parent, like my identity is striped away and I change some things around my vision. I've decided I actually, next summer, I want to take six weeks off. This wasn't part of the vision. Now my life vision changed through this sickness because I really appreciated health. I really appreciated family even more. And I changed it. And now I need to go back to my vision board and change that. That actually now my business needs to work around me having six weeks off in the summer. So yes, let's keep the vision fluid. Um, 
Okay, let me see one more question here. It'd be great if you address the disconnect folks have between what is possible versus what they can get. The real challenge, as you say, is to break this mindset by breaking the sense of scarcity, not having arrived, not enough money, et cetera, that folks feel they must get to so they are free to do what they want. This is beautiful, Raja. Thank you, Thank you for sharing. Um, there is a disconnect what is possible versus what they can get. Okay. So when we're doing the vision, we are tapping into the desire. It doesn't mean I will ask you to quit your job and become a yoga teacher. Or if you don't get what something that's good enough, you're not going to leave your job. So it's not around necessarily taking action is around being clear what you want, what would bring you life, what will get you the joy, and then trusting that ideas will come and opportunities will come. And, and it might take some time. When I first did my coaching training, I told you it was 2014. When I left Google to become a coach, it was beginning of 2018. It took me three years to to get the courage to leave Google and do my own business. So it's not around some, some big changes might take more time, but by the time, and, and when I started, it felt impossible to me. It felt impossible that I would manage through coaching to have uh, the similar lifestyle for my family that I had from a senior Google job at, in London. But once I started moving, once I submitted the resignation, opportunities started coming my way that I didn't even know it was ex existed. And I have so many stories and my clients have so many stories that something feels impossible right now because you don't know all the ideas that will come to you and all the opportunities once you start moving, when you start exploring towards the right di direction. And I'll talk a little bit about fear later. But Jad, thank you for sharing. Uh, we have some especially as highly educated folks, hard to get the brain out of the way and frankly, to take risk away from the sizable state of paycheck with families. Uh, I will talk about that. that that's um, the last point I'm going to make. Let's see here what we have. Oh yeah, that's exactly my point now. The number one obstacle you will need to overcome to get clarity about your desired future. And Rajat gave it away, I think. Um, when I left Google for my coaching business, I, I worked with people on clarity, and this is what the masterclass is about, where you are, where you're going, and then leadership, right? And what really struck me was when people didn't know what they wanted and they would buy the coaching for that, um, it only took, for the vast majority of them, one or two sessions, and it became really clear what they wanted and my hypothesis from that is that people know what they want but in most cases they're afraid to admit it to themselves and it was only one case that I worked with someone in six sessions so we were working for six months and she was an ex-consultant highly educated folks ex-MBA consultant and she wanted to after a career break, go come back. And we did create the options, right? Insurance and finance and consulting. And she was meeting people. And I've never seen such a successful networker in my life. She had tons of meetings every week with people to explore what she wanted. And we were exploring and third sector. We, we explored exploring all the buckets, right? And by the end, she, she got a few couple of offers and, and everything fell through. And something wasn't clicking. And it was in the sixth session that she came to me and said, you know what, I want to be a politician. And that was not something we were working on. That was not in the, in the options. Why wasn't it? Because being a politician was a huge risk. Would she give away you know, the MBA, the business career? What would people think? She would need to move the company back in her home country because most people need to become a politician in their home country. And that's why the, this desire was buried un, under so much fear. Um, and that's why it took us longer to unearth that desire. So the number one obstacle you will need to overcome 
to get clarity about your future is fear. Fear that you will succeed. Fear you will be fail. You will fail. A lot of us, like as Rajat said, I won't get that job. If I go after, I will get rejected. Uh, they will make fun of me. Fear my family will disapprove. A lot of the times when I work with people, we have they will bring what their spouse or life partner will think about this because they need to make joint decisions, right? You can, if you want to become an entrepreneur or take a salary cut, all these things, what will my family say? If I actually admit even to myself, this is what I want. And, and a big one is I will give up what I have worked hard to achieve. And to that, I say we usually overestimate that risk. And there's something Steve Jobs said that I like. He said, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And he was saying that how a class he took in calligraphy when he was at university helped the Mac. And I've seen this again and again. When I was leaving Google to become a coach, a fear of me was all my career, all my, my, my MBA, my career in tech, I'm giving all that away to become a coach. I, I felt like I was giving away everything I've built so hard. But now looking back, I didn't give anything away. My career in Google, my, my business acumen, my business knowledge, everything makes me the coach that I am today. And that's same with you. Even if you do a huge career change, anything you've worked hard, your reputation, even I have this with people that I have a reputation in the company and they're scared of going in a different company because they will have to build their reputation from scratch. Nothing goes away. But you, cannot, you can only look, connect the dots looking backwards. I won't be able to change my mind. That's another big fear. And that's not true either. We, we try things and with the information we have. And then maybe we get more information and we realize it wasn't the right thing. And we can always change our minds. I, we, you can, companies do that all the time. They will extend offers and take them away or they'll hire people and then fire them. But I, I see when I'm working with people, they're like, if I get this job, I need to make it right so I can stay for the next five to 10 years. Well, you don't have to. Yeah, it would be great, but you can always change your mind. So what's the solution for the fear? Because it's a real thing and it's useful. Our brain wants to keep us safe, not to keep us happy. And what I say here, the solution is to be playful and experiment. And play with the vision. This is a vision board. This is you playing with images on a Google slide. This is not around you quitting your job. Uh, or anything drastic like that. Once you've created some, follow your curiosity, once you've created a few options that you think are interesting, design experiments, talk to people doing that thing and see how you feel, maybe do a volunteering project, maybe whatever this experiment will be that you test the hypothesis that you can, you like that or get more information. And then you can, then we can move to strategy. Can you actually get that? Is there a skill you're missing? As I said, for me, from the moment I started being interested in coaching to the moment I, I was able to leave the job and launch a successful coaching business, it took me years. And that's okay too. Sometimes a big transition will take longer. Um, but what I say is I don't want people to jump from a plane if they cannot see what's going, what's under. So a lot of the times the fear, we're paralyzed by fear because we don't see. And I'm, I'm, then I'm saying, don't jump. Let's, let's see what's if you jump. Let's talk to people. Let's make a plan. Let's prove the hypothesis. Like I proved the hypothesis that people were willing to pay me money for coaching before I left my job at Google. And that was important. It wasn't a lot of money, but I, I had proved to myself that people were willing to pay for this. Uh, it would be almost impossible for me to leave that job if I hadn't. Okay, let's summarize where we are so far and feel free to, to ask more questions. The number one secret, a vision is a place you come from, not a place you're going. The number one mistake, focusing on what you don't want instead of what you want. Number two mistake, focusing on what you think is possible instead of what brings you joy. And number one obstacle is fear. In what is you think is possible, I go again, we don't know what's possible. A story I usually say is how I got published by Penguin. 
and I I put on my vision board. It was a similar story to Google, very similar. It happened 10 years later. It would happen in 2019 instead of 2009. I put in my vision board that I wanted to get published. I wanted to write a book, but everybody would say to me that it's impossible to get a traditional published. You need to get an agent. You need to have a hundred thousand followers. And after it became clear and I cleared my calendar, I'm saying, I'm doing this. I'm writing a book. I want to get published. Penguin reached out to me and they said, we're doing a Penguin Business Expert series. And we found an article you wrote online and we want you to write a book. This was not even conceivable. I, nobody knew. If you search online, nobody will tell you that a publisher will, will reach out to an, an unpublished author and ask them to write a book unless you're super famous. This wasn't in my range of possibility, but I put it in my vision board anyway. And then it happened. And I knew that this is what I wanted. And I grasped the opportunity when it came because I knew that it was the, what I wanted. But my point of that is not only, oh, magic, woohoo, oh, the, you put it in your vision board and it happens. It's more around you put it in your vision board, even if you think it's impossible, because you have no idea what's possible and what isn't. Okay. Any other questions? Now it's the time. You have been here. Feel free to, to ask anything else. And let me give you a minute. If you don't have questions, please write down what was the key takeaway so far? What is the one? Let's consolidate the learning from this masterclass. What is the one thing you want to take away from this? What's the one thing you, you will do differently? Andrew says if will a recording be available the recording will be available in the LinkedIn event for the people that have subscribed to the event uh, because this is a live one um, and I think we're going to upload it on YouTube as well uh, once this is ready I missed the first 40 minutes oh I'm so sorry yes you're in the event Andrew and you you the recording will be available right after Okay, how can one approach creating a vision for work and personal life? So I have four sections that I work with people on their vision. The, the sections are love, play, health, and work. And we start with health and love, health and relationships. And... We start there, what we want to create, who do we want to have in our lives, what are the relationships, what are the health habits we want to have. Then I work on, on values too. And this is all work that exists in the coaching program, right? We work on what are your top five values. And I, I've seen the work on values is actually what makes the biggest difference on people actually changing behavior and having more work-life balance. I, in the previous vision path, there was a very hardworking participant and when she did the values she realized health is one of the values family was one of the values and values what does it mean where you give your energy your money and your time and she realized what the life she was leaving was not aligned with her values and that was what made the biggest shift so the values work and also being really clear starting with health and relationships first because you before you even go to work does this answer the question? Okay. I, I see some people starting getting, um, writing their takeaways, which is lovely. Please write your takeaways because it will help. Um, would you recommend any specific software to use to create a vision board? I use a Google slide in my program. We use a Google slides and we just add images or from Google. I think it's important. Why do I use a Google slide? I think it's important to be in one slide. I didn't always have it that way, my vision board, but I, now I have it in one slide because then I can make it as a background on my desktop, which is pretty cool because that means every time, especially now with remote working, when you, I open my laptop, I can see photos of my family being happy, photos of everything I want to create, my dream house, uh, awards I'm going to, to win and all those things. So I don't recommend a software. We keep it simple, Google Slides mm -hmm. and Google Images. And feel free to add any more questions in the end. It's for Marianne Williamson. 
Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. Okay. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for investing this time in getting inspiration about how to create a life vision. I hope you go and you ask yourself the big questions of what brings me joy, irrespective of whether it's possible or not. I hope you start feeling, embodying that vision now, making the vision tangible and embodying it now. And, and then your brain change, your behavior change, your feelings change, and the reality rearranges itself around you. And thank you for, for your time. And I hope to see you, to, to see you soon. Um, I, I will be doing more masterclasses in, in different topics. So feel free to connect on LinkedIn, uh, subscribe to the newsletter. I'd love to see you again in a future masterclass. All right, take care.